poisonous plants. I'm not here to scare anybody with this presentation. Uh, I just want to recap some of the information that's available. There's quite a few sources on poisonous plants. Uh, they do, questions do arise that go to the poison control centers regarding ingestion of plant material. And that's what I'm going to try to, to cover here today. If I can, bear with me. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. It's also been quite a while since I've given a presentation, so uh, I'm a little bit rusty at this. What is a poison? A poison is any product or substance that can harm someone if it's used in the wrong way, by the wrong person, or in the wrong amount. And that comes directly from the Carolina Poison Control Center. And again, I've emphasized can harm. It all depends on the level of exposure. And the most important uh, principle of toxicology is the dose makes the poison. So it's, if you, uh, you can be exposed to these things, working with them and whatever, and maybe not have any problem whatsoever. But keep in mind that if you work in a nursery and handle certain plants eight hours a day, while you're sweating and everything, your exposure is considerably different. Okay, and there are four routes of exposure, uh, obviously, to plants. Uh, starting over here, inhalation is the first. And uh, anybody have hay fever, allergies? Okay, you're probably starting to notice those, right? Yeah, that's the, not here. I think I must have lost the battery. I'll get a new one. <laughs> Off to a good start. Yep, the red light's on now. Less green. We can hear you. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Okay. All right. Inhalation, uh, which is typically pollen when we're talking about plants. Ocular, we don't want to get a lot of these materials in our eyes for obvious reasons. Dermal, of course, and that can be all the way from just skin irritation to enough exposure to initiate the histamine response, which uh, makes it a little bit more uh, difficult. And finally, ingestion. And it's not a good idea to eat plants you're not familiar with, growing in your vegetable garden or whatever. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily eat weeds like, uh, like Dennis is portraying here. <laughs> Actually, my background is in weed control or weed science, so I would say kill more weeds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Proceed. Poisonous plants in perspective. Uh, a poisonous plant list, and we'll go through these here today, it can be quite a lengthy list, but if you look at poison control center data, plants are 20th and 25 of the things most frequently involved in human poisoning questions. And uh, the first few was ones are probably under your sink in your kitchen. Uh, those are some of the more dangerous things around the house. And dietary supplements, herbal, herbal, herbals or homeopathic is 23rd, not too far behind the plants. In fact, some of the, the homeopathic things are extracts from plants. So uh, Dennis will talk a little bit more about that. And these things are all what's called plant secondary metabolites. That is, they're, they're not involved with what the plant is doing every day to, to live, but they are, in fact, groups of chemicals that the plant synthesizes for various other things in the plant, like lignans, which go into cell walls, uh, and uh, alkaloids, which Dennis is going to talk quite a bit about, uh, flavones, and down here, Flavonols, which is uh, like flower color, uh, anthocyanins, which also is flower color. So a lot of other things are going on the plant at any one given time, in addition to what it does just to stay alive. Plant poisonings frequently involve children under five pretending plant material is food. This is very important. The scenario that a lot of children get involved with is if they're playing something that involves food, a kitchen sort of thing or whatever, and they'll want to grab something to pretend that it's lettuce or whatever, 
and they typically take the first thing that's available and that's an exposure that wouldn't normally happen. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. It can also result in sick, simple ignorance or misidentification, uh, especially when they're making like teas, uh, putting things into or leaves into water and whatever, and uh, making a, a tea and then drinking of that tea. Uh, that's another route of exposure. And then playful curiosity of uh, babies and young pets, especially th keep in mind that I'm talking also about potential harm to household pets, cats and dogs. And of course, puppies are particularly curious and tend to put a lot of things in your mouths, as you know, and they are something to watch as well. Symptoms typically begin with nausea, cramps, vomiting, diarrhea when ingested uh, with uh, of course, dermal, it's more scratching. Uh, again, with uh, uh, pollen, it's more the, the nasal thing. But those are all histamine responses. That's your body's way of trying to reduce the exposure to these things. The, uh, obviously, the cramps and the vomiting in order to get rid of what's been ingested that uh, it perceives as possibly harmful. Uh, the uh, nasal problem, the, uh, Creating mu mucus, which can clean out the nasal passages and also insulate the nasal passage area in order to avoid the contact with the pollen grains or whatever. And of course, scratching is a lot of uh, the reason for scratching is to get rid of the skin cells that are actually causing the stimulation of the reaction. Again, it's part of the histamine response that the body is, is using to try to deal with these things. Uh, common inhalation allergens, uh, I'm not starting out at the right time of the year, but the fall ones are primarily ragweed and <coughs> things like pigweed and uh, also uh, well, growing along the red, red side would be goldenrod, that's another one that uh, 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 is an allergen in the fall. And grasses, grass pollen, uh, they're more in the spring. and. Uh, also going into the summer and fall depending on the species but spring is is the biggest time and Bermuda grass is kind of an interesting one here we've got plenty of that around here and uh, Bermuda grass is a, a turf grass a pasture grass a weed and an allergen so it's a, uh, it's quite well known and then trees also trees make really good allergens because they're tall uh, they catch a lot of wind to blow the pollen long distances. Uh, they're large, generate a lot of pollen. And one of the things we're, we're dealing with here now uh, is maples. Uh, our two main pollen sources right now are maples and junipers. Uh, elms also, we don't have so many of those, but uh, they are also uh, an allergen, and mulberry is an allergen, a very powerful one. There aren't a lot of mulberry trees around, but it's a surprisingly powerful allergen. Pecans are an allergen, sec second only to ragweed, but it's primarily in the spring, and less potent but uh, more productive. Uh, some of the oaks, and uh, also they are prevalent in the spring. And loblolly pine, the, we, the poor loblolly pine, uh, we give it a bad rap when that yellow stuff starts coming down. Everybody's allergies are really going and they say, well, it's the loblolly pine that's causing the allergy. Well, in order for an allergen to be an allergen by inhalation, it has to be airborne. And that yellow pollen, as you know, that falls on your car and whatever, is not very airborne. It is, in fact, too heavy to be respirable. So what's hurting your nasal passages at that time is not the loblolly pine pollen, but all of the other pollens that are out there, like the maples and the oaks and, uh, and some grass pollen at that time and a lot of other things. And also, don't forget molds. I don't talk about this, but they are, in fact, a, a large uh, cause of a lot of the nasal allergens as well. 
Okay, uh, now for routes other than inhalation, we start to talk about uh, ingestion here. And number one on the list from a plant perspective is usually the, uh, the castor bean uh, and the toxin there is an alkaloid called ricin. It's highly toxic and according to the FBI's data that keeps data based upon murders and whatever, plutonium, botulism, toxin, and ricin is in third place. It's a very toxic thing and that's something if you uh, if, if you have castor bean in your yard uh, be very careful especially when they go to seed because the seeds can be very toxic in fact uh, before I left Kansas City there was a lady that worked in a lab that got a bunch of castor bean seeds and ground them up and killed his, her husband and, and two of his sons and she set fire to her house but she used the ricin as the as the vehicle for the for the murders, so it's it's nothing to to play around with from a plant perspective. Other euphorbs also uh, are uh, potential issues. A lot of the sap plants, the white sap plants, that are at least uh, skin irritants. Uh, poinsettia around the holidays causes some concern, especially for uh, animals. There's, there's some will. Uh, ingest those and uh, veterinarians get calls as a result of that. The lily AC is a very similar situation. The lily family is prized to a lot of people. There are a lot of these around the house, but they all contain, uh, well, this first one contains colchicine, which you probably worked with in, in your botany lab. It's an uh, inhibitor of cell division. So it's used to, to show the different stages of cell division when you, when you were in your biology lab. But anyway, uh, the main culprit in this area is oxalic acid. And you find oxalic acid is a, a problem in the area of ingestion in many plants, and the lilies are no exception. Oxalic acid is a very corrosive acid, much more uh, corrosive than acetic acid. And uh, if it's ingested, it could cause uh, numbing and burning of the lips, numbing and burning inside the mouth. And if enough is ingested, it can burn the esophagus and all the way down into the stomach. So, yes. And here's a new plant, that shrub that I've been seeing. It's a lily of the valley shrub. Would that have the same properties as I don't know. You'd have to look and see. There, there's a lot of variation in the level of oxalic acid, and it's not always harmful. It depends on the species, and some varieties are even dip, uh, uh, differ in regard to the oxalic acid content. A lot of our vegetables have oxalic acid in, in them, too. It's, it's not unusual in the, in the plant family, but the lilies are a, a species, as a general rule, have higher levels than and they actually uh, do cause some problems. My vet said that the most uh, problem she gets on, from ingestion to cats is, is oxalic acid from lilies uh, in the home. Uh, Wayne? Yeah. Look at the valley shrub is a pieris, mm -hmm. which is in the rhododendron family, so not even closely related to that. Okay. And that's why you don't look at common names, because sometimes it just means it looks like. Looks like, yeah. yeah. Doesn't yeah. mean the same. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, on these, or is it the seeds that people ingest, or the leaves they're touching? What's the no, the leaves primarily with oxalic acid. You're eating them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Eating them. Yeah. Ingestion here. But just putting them in the mouth is enough to cause problems, potentially. It's and when, when you have excess oxalic acid, it's sort of a pucker deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is in spinach. Um, right. But it's not the level there is not. Yeah. Yeah. The levels are much higher in these. And other oxalic acid plants, there are a number of them in the home. The best known here is Stephen Bachbier, or dumb cane. And uh, it gets its name actually, well, the dumb cane is, is because of if you ingest the leaves, oxalic acid content is high enough that it becomes difficult to talk. 
because of the injury to the to the lips and to the tongue, etc. So that that's one plant to, to watch if children would put that in their mouth or something. It's not going to kill them, but it could certainly be very uncomfortable. And some of the other plants, again, it's fairly common. Pokeberry is one here that, that can be dangerous, uh, particularly the, uh, uh, the fruit. And the poisonous wild plants, of course, this is probably the most important one here, not because of ingestion, but because of skin contact. And this is one of the things that I spend a lot of time trying to train and remind my grandchildren about because it's very <laughs> ubiquitous. And the thing to remember and tell children is leaves of three, let it be, because that's your poison ivy and poison oak. Uh, those are two of the most common for the some people can be extremely uh, uh, sensitive to it. And I know all you botanists are saying those aren't leaves, those are leaflets. But leaves of three, uh, it works with kids. It's, it's easy to remember. Uh, others that are, can be somewhat poisonous, English ivy, not a lot of people eat that. And, uh, uh, also morning glories. And, uh, Wisteria seeds can be dangerous to consume. So I, I just keep this in mind because if you have children that play in these areas, I think these seed pods could be attractive to them in some way. What are the poisons in these things? Are they are they is it are these all oxalic acid poisons again? No, they vary a lot. Some of them are a combination of different things and some of these things, but they're just at high enough levels where they, they can make people or, or have some. Uh, you can go online and look up a lot of these things. Question? Yes. Uh, so would these things be toxic to all mammals? Because, for example, in a harsh winter, the deer will devour all the English ivy that the birds have mm -hmm. planted in my yard. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I also, I used to put my poinsettias in the spring. I'd plant them out in the garden. And I think it was probably the juvenile deer. They didn't devour the poinsettias, but they nibbled them weekly mm -hmm. and kept them nicely pruned for me. But <laughs> someone was repeatedly nibbling on the poinsettia plants, which I thought were supposed to give them a you know bad stomachache or something, but yeah. they kept coming back. Uh, that's a really good point. Animals vary. I'm talking here mainly in terms of cats and dogs, but outdoor animals, of course, they're used to eating in the wild. And they may have built up a toxin to some of the, or a, a tolerance to some of these things uh, that uh, humans and pets don't have because they aren't eating outside. Sometimes if deer just nibble on things, that's their way of finding out if there's any problem with, with eating it. They'll, they'll take a nibble today maybe and say, oh, that tastes good, but then they encounter some kind of problem and they come back and say, well, that's not the best thing to eat. I'm going to eat, eat something else. It, it, it really varies. Uh, but just because it's safe to wild animals doesn't necessarily mean it's safe to humans. Again, it's a question of also body weight versus the, the level of ingestion uh, as to whether or not it's going to be toxic. The solanaceous plants, uh, Dennis is going to talk more about those, but uh, they are full of alkaloids. Uh, they are, this is the nightshade family, and uh, uh, you can tell, tell here the uh, deadly nightshade, uh, atropine, which Dennis will talk about, uh, tobacco, it's full of uh, of course, some of these have nicotine in them, but not as much as our, our uh, domestic tobacco. One thing that's here is Irish potato. And basically, the part here that's harmful is this green skin. And I think probably in the processing, a lot of the potatoes that have the greening on them are, are weeded out. Hmm. But the potatoes that have green on them, the, the um, selenium, 
uh, content is much larger than the normal potato. Uh, and uh, they can, in fact, be, be toxic. That is, particularly the, the green uh, skin on the potato. Uh, also, the berries, etc. The foliage is also higher than solamine in potatoes. And it's an interesting story because years ago, uh, some of the native potatoes were brought up from South America and they were observed not to have problems with Colorado potato beetles. Some of the plant breeders bred those with normal domestic potatoes and sure enough they helped with the Colorado potato beetle problem but they actually made people sick <laughs> because the solanine content was high enough in those wild plants that it, it worked for the insects, but also became toxic to humans. So uh, this is just an interesting example of these sorts of things. So, uh, frequently a question of, uh, of concentration, et cetera. Uh, seeds from trees are sometimes uh, can be toxic. Not very many people eat acorns. Uh, of course, deer and other animals do. Uh, to not too much problem, but they're full of tannins, so they can be very acidic and, and probably would be uh, repulsive to the taste buds of, of humans. But anyway, squirrels like them and whatever, but uh, also we don't eat very many peach seeds, but I think most of you are aware that a lot of the uh, uh, fruit tree seeds are high in arsenic, and uh, we don't eat them, but it's a good reason why we we don't eat them. Uh, okay, taxes. We also talk about that too. Okay, most of you are aware of taxine here. Uh, it's coming from some of these plants, azalea and rhododendrons. Uh, oleander is probably worth mentioning. Uh, there are some instances where people <coughs> consume enough oleander to at least. Uh, cause a question of whether or not there's ingestion problems with the, the oleander because it is an attractive species. And uh, some of the other things out in the wild, uh, unripe fruit, uh, water hemlock, holly, it's not a good idea to eat berries with a lot of any, almost any plant that uh, you're not familiar with, because they do, berries tend to concentrate things, obviously, because the, uh, the, the seed, obviously, uh, has nutrients in it. And uh, some of the others here, hyacinth bean, uh, hydrangeas, the uh, ligustrum, especially the uh, privet berries. Again, something to not consume. And uh, some of the less tolerant things that you'd have to consume more of, things like boxwood, iris, uh, mums. Uh, this is, you can see, a, a dermatitis from the oil. Probably you can handle mums as a gardener without much problem, but if you worked at some place and handled mums for eight hours a day, you'd probably have enough oil on you that you'd feel that effect. Hyacinth, also uh, dermatitis, or dermatitis. Again, with dermatitis, it depends on the level of dermal exposure and your particular sensitivity to those particular uh, plants. Hoppies. Uh, there are frequently questions about our common poppy and California poppy. Uh, are they actually uh, dangerous like the opium poppy, poppy and the Mexican prickle pop, prickle poppy? Hard to say. Uh, no, they are, are not. The, the domestic poppy, poppy is not, a, not harmful. It's not high enough in alkaloids to, to cause a problem. Nope. Just lost those batteries too. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Boy, you need some new batteries. 
Well, they bought all new ones and then they promptly didn't charge them. So how about if we spin this around a little bit, Wayne? Would that be okay? Okay. I'm almost done. Yeah. <coughs> okay, some poison prevention tips here in the end. Know your plants and educate children. Uh, some of these species, like the dumb cane and things like that, keep those in mind and keep them uh, out of reach of children if you can. Uh, avoidance is the best way to, to not have to worry about these kinds of things. Uh, and especially out of the reach of small children. Remember pets, which are also at risk, particularly puppies and cats uh, that tend to be curious and tend to want to try things. Uh, human rest is not always equal risk to birds and other animals. Uh, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, one of the differences relative to your question uh, amongst animal species is the length of time something is kept into the digestive tract. With birds, things are kept in the digestive tract uh, depending on species, sometimes just a matter of hours before it just goes straight through so they can ingest things that are fairly toxic because there's not going to be enough uh, metabolism, enough release during that period of time to cause them any problems. But in the case of humans, we keep things in our digestive system for two or three days, and uh, that's another matter. So uh, I don't know about deer in particular or some of these other animals, but that could be one of the variations as well. Uh, burning can also produce uh, problems, especially poison ivy or poison sumac. So if you're cleaning out the, the uh, fence row in your backyard or whatever and burning some of that, it's best to not be downwind of the, of the burning, especially if it has a lot of poison ivy and poison oak in it. And the Carolina Poison Control Center is where to, to call if there's ingestion. Uh, there you get some experts like Dennis that really know this stuff and can get into detail with you <coughs> about the, the level of exposure and things and uh, be more specific about what the, what the risk might be. Uh, don't hesitate, again, Carolina Poison Control Center. And there are a lot of sources of information. Uh, a lot of them from uh, NCSU, again, if you uh, Google NCSU poisonous plants, you can come up with a lot of this kind of information and a lot of the information about contacting the Poison Control Center and whatever. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to the true expert here. Today. Dennis, I just thought about a hidden set of batteries over here in this guy. Let's go ahead and get that swapped out. They took the battery recharging unit out of my office where I kept really good control over it, and they put it somewhere else where no one takes care of it anymore. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead and turn the lights up for a little bit. Sure, we can do that, Dennis. There we go. There we go, that one's showing a good charge. Up here in the center, want me to do it, Dennis? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna just pinch the shirt a little bit. There we go, and I can go inside your pocket. Okay. It's all yours, Dennis? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> feel a little strange. <laughs> well, I wanna go off in a different direction entirely. Uh, Wayne has given us a really good uh, recap of um, what can we expect in the way of uh, going out in the yard uh, or the forest or whatever and finding uh, difficulties, uh, encountering difficulties with poisonous plants. That to me is kind of like the dark side of the force. <laughs> and, um, what, what has been the history of, of man, or humankind, I should say, is that um, we as a species have been very clever about 
uh, using this uh, resource, which is actually what it is, to solve certain kinds of problems. And I think many of you have heard of uh, a poison called curare. Um, this was developed by the Indians in South America and uh, was used to get their food. And fortunately, this was one of those uh, toxins that is not uh, acid safe. In other words, um, when they uh, kill, actually what they would do, what Curara does is paralyze. And uh, when, it, when it brought down some, some food and they cooked it and ate it, um, that, that toxin was destroyed by the cooking and the acid in the stomach. And so um, worked out just great. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, um, we have developed a lot of other uses for poisonous plants. And I won't uh, start out with getting into detail about cancer, but cancer is kind of, uh, treatment of cancer is kind of at the other end of this progression from where uh, in very ancient times, people found uses for plant poisons in order to do things like uh, fight their enemies, bring down the food, uh, uh, make war with uh, the other, the rest of the animal kingdom. Uh, now we're kind of at the other end of all that, and we're we're looking at trying to solve major problems that we we have in our society, and obviously one of those is cancer. More recently, we've been developing targeted therapies for cancer. But um, a big breakthrough some time ago was to find things in nature that would uh, stop the, the growth of cancer. We have this problem uh, because when we want to fight cancer, cancer is really the same as us. The only difference with cancer is it's an unregulated us. Mm -hmm. And so the one big difference we have with cancer is that it just keeps wanting to reproduce all the time. Whereas if, you, if you're trying to deal with a, a bacterial infection, now you're looking at a cell wall that's entirely different than our cell walls. So if you find a chemical, for example, that will attach to the cell wall of a bacterium, then you can, you can attack it and not attack the host. Uh, what initially they, they like to call the, the magic bullet. Right? Well, the, the magic bullet with cancer is that this cancer is always trying to reproduce and it's trying to reproduce very quickly. So what you need to do is to find a toxin that goes in there and um, messes up the reproduction system and uh, we can tolerate that to a certain extent because although we do have some fast growing cells, right, the hair, the stomach, I mean people go on chemotherapy, what happens, right? They lose their hair, uh, they have a, a, a lot of stomach problems, but by attacking the cancer in this way, um, we, we may just buy some time or we may actually wipe out some, some cancers, may actually solve some cancer problems. Uh, there's, there's more of a discussion, I, I brought in a, 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 a display board that I put on the back and there's, there's more discussion about the details about how some of these cancer treatments came along. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with Taxol, and uh, this is something that treats um, breast cancer. In the meantime, there is also a uh, extract from um, uh, Mayapple that the, uh, the Indians were, American Indians were aware of, and it's been, been being used for colon cancer. And uh, 
there uh, are, are some other examples of, of this, this kind of thing. So we have this, we have this progression of um, uh, our understanding of, uh, of, of poisonous plants, of what we can get with them, uh, analyzing the components of them, and the, uh, the, the, so the difference between a, uh, a poisonous plant and something else kind of gets blurred out to a certain extent. Um, you know, if, if we've got this kind of thing, well, it's really a medicinal plant. And this actually has been the case all through human history that we have found uh, plants that will uh, help us deal with certain kinds of health problems. So um, one of the things I want to get into, um, and it's it's the kind of the bottom the bottom of your handout, and uh, unfortunately, this is a, this is very complicated. On the other hand, it's absolutely essential to understanding the uh, pharmacology of, of plants and, and how they work. So let me just... Just a slight advance for Dennis, there you go. Yeah. Oh, this was the, uh, this is the same thing you've got in your handout, right? But there's more detail in back. Okay, so the important thing about the body is that it must remain in balance. This is, this is um, the, the cardinal principle. Uh, we have a lot of things, uh, regu um, systems that regulate uh, our functions, and what they do is they usually uh, attack from two sides in order to make sure that we maintain balance. When we, when we look at the nervous system, we find there's a particular part of the nervous system that's quite critical to maintaining balance. So let's just review that a little bit uh, as to what, what we've got. Naturally, we've got the central nervous system. We've got the somatic nervous system, which controls the muscles. Uh, with the sensory nervous system, but we've also got uh, a pair of nervous systems that act counter to each other, and that's this one versus the other to maintain the balance. This is um, probably something that came about uh, the, uh, you know hundreds of thousands of million years ago when we were being chased around by. Uh, saber through tigers and we needed to get out of the way and so um, there there was a system that um, assisted in fight or flight and I think many of you already have heard of this this kind of thing It's called the sympathetic nervous system which you may not have heard of is the one that turns off the sympathetic nervous system and that's the parasympathetic nervous system. So these, these two work in opposition to each other. And we have, so we have here, and I'm referring to, to up, this side for up, in terms of, this is what you get, gets you up to, to go do your fight or your flight. And so, I, I need to let's see. Where's the pointer? There isn't a pointer here, is there? Yeah. The pointer's on the slide. Oh, on the slide. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Here's Top button. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what we need to do is to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And notice some of the uh, chemicals that that activate the sympathetic nervous <coughs> system. Adrenaline, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, cocaine. Okay. And, and these, these are essential for you 
because there are times when you, you need to get revved up. Um, now, as I in indicated, this, this parasympathetic nervous system works just the opposite way. So, when I activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is four here, and I use these chemicals, and these actually turn off the effect of these chemicals. And um, the curious thing that, has, that comes up in when you start studying plants is that we've got a lot of these chemicals, Wayne just talked about this, the so-called tropane alkaloids, so atropines, copolamine, and so on. So these can also give you uh, an, an effect of ramping up the, the uh, system or, or taking down the things that these take down. So we need to make just kind of a little list to see what we're affecting. So if I'm being chased by this hypothetical saber-toothed tiger and um, I, I want something to happen with me that's going to make it so that I can, I can get away from the threat, what sort of things do I need my body to do? Okay. I need to run. Great. I need to run. So what would help me with running? Muscles. What? Muscles. Muscles. Okay. So what helps the muscles? Increased oxygen in there. Oxygen. I, I need more oxygen, don't I, to, to keep the, uh, the muscles going. What else do I need for muscles? Sugar. Sugar. Okay, now I've only got so much of that stuff in the body. So if I'm going to make sure I get plenty of this, to the muscles that I need to, to fight or flee, then what about other things in the body? What am I going to do with those? Increase your heart rate. Okay. Okay, heart rate up. Which of course also means your blood pressure goes up. Right? Okay, but if I'm, if I'm trying to get as much as I can into the muscles, what about all that blood that's in my stomach and my intestines? It's not good to your limbs, your legs. I want, it to go to my, I want it to go to my arms and my legs, right? Mm -hmm. So the stomach, the stomach gets shut down. Okay. Now it turns out, since uh, with the, uh, the parasympathetic, when I'm using this, uh, these tropane alkaloids, and, and these, remember this side is for up, this side's for down, these are going to have the same effect as these. It turns out that if I, if I want to get more heart rate, if I want to get more blood pressure, these are the ones that do the best job at that. But if I want to do something about shutting down the stomach, these actually turn out to be the ones that are best for that. So if, if I want to uh, take a ride on, on my cruise, and I'm expecting uh, heavy seas, and I've got to do something to make sure I don't get seasick. What do I do? I get a patch of scopolamine. 
okay? Which is, which is coming from the, the uh, solanaceous plants. Okay? These, are, these, these are all being, all these chemicals are being supplied by, by the solanaceae. Okay? These come from kind of a variety of, of locations, the adrenaline, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and cocaine. Uh, ephedrine um, has a history that goes way back into China, where they found uh, ephedra sinica was very good for treating colds, and they had absolutely no idea why. Uh, have, have any of you grown ephedra, by the way? You, this is a plant you can actually grow around here. Uh, do, do you want to tell us a little bit what it looks like? No, I just got it. I'm sorry. What does it look like? It looks scraggly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does, like, look, does look scraggly. I don't know how to explain it. It looks like it's uh, branching out. It's mostly stems, isn't it? Yes, stems. Okay, the, the leaves are very reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably meant for a, a desert type environment of some kind. Uh, I've tried growing in the past. It's the devil to keep drained well enough. Uh, so I actually had to set up a, a special little uh, tiny garden for it, you know, where uh, you just, just put a lot of sand in it, you know. And <laughs> hope you can keep it uh, dry enough. Okay, so, okay, what, what, about, what about the word ephedrine? Does that sound familiar at all? Absolutely. Now, the only difference between these two, uh, in chemistry, there's something called an optical isomer. And some of you may have heard of that, some not. But the, the basic idea is that with your, your sugars in your body, they'll, they'll be one way, but they won't be the other way. Proteins are the same way. You've got right-handed proteins and left-handed proteins. Well, you've also got left-handed and right-handed chemicals, and it turns out that the ephedrine is one way, and the pseudoephedrine is the other, mm. and the reason the pharmaceutical industry settled on pseudoephedrine is that they found with it, they had fewer side effects than with the ephedrine. That's, that's why um, for decades, we went out to treat colds. Uh, we were using pseudoephedrine. And it goes back to this, this idea here that things that aren't part of uh, needing blood for the muscles, for example, having uh, blood go through the capillaries of your nose, that wasn't really needed. That was shut down. And also, part of what you wanted was to uh, open up that area so you could get more air going through. The other uh, thing that, that used to be and now has changed is um, the, the effect on the eye. Uh, it, it turns out that if you, if you want to have uh, a better chance of getting away from danger, it's good if you've got better vision. So you, you want to dilate. You want to dilate the eye. And for, and for years, uh, one of these uh, tropin alkaloids was what was put into your eye at the, uh, at the doctor's, at the ophthalmologist's office in order to, to, to get that dilation. So of course he could, he could look inside the eye and, and see how the retina looked and so on. So we've, we've got um, all these uses then for, uh, for plant uh, alkaloids in, and uh, we have to consider them medicines. But on the other hand, we know that people die from, from cocaine. 
And actually, they also die from ephedrine, right? You've seen that in the news where people get an overdose. Now, it's true that for a lot of things, uh, overdose is a problem. And as Wayne already uh, made the point, the dose makes the poison. Right? Now, that's, that's actually a little bit of a shock because uh, back in ancient days in the, the Greeks and the Romans, they thought more in terms of this plant was good and this plant was bad and so on. And then along a came a uh, physician, Paracelsus, sometime a thousand years later, who said, no, that's not it. It's, it's not the thing so much as how much of the thing that, that you ingest. So we've got this big problem then when, when you want to talk about a poisonous plant, um, you would have to do it in regard to uh, how much was consumed, for example. And, and so we, we've got that problem, and then we've also got this problem that even if, if you look at um, what we might be considered edible plants, they're not free of toxins, okay? Um, sweet potato has got furans. Onion and garlic has n-propyl disulfide. Uh, mustard family has methyl disulfide. Um, carrot family has got uh, furanocumarins, and so on. The, the list just goes on. One of the things we, we, we did in class one time when I was, when I was taking this class, uh, was to, to go through and analyze your Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> and see what it was on that list that didn't have some kind of a toxin in it. <coughs> so we've got edible plants with toxins, we've got um, so-called poisonous plants that are being used extensively for, for medicines, it would be really nice, you know, if you walked into the woods and there were like little signs sitting around and said, you know, uh, you know, I'm a medicinal plant, and this next one said, no, I'm, uh, I'm an edible plant, and so on. Uh, it's really a very confused situation, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> Let's see, uh, I'm trying to think. There was something else. I think I'll stop there and, and uh, see if you all have any questions. Yes. I have a comment, not a question. As a nurse, we use um, adrenaline as epinephrine. That is the first drug of choice in a code situation. Right. And cocaine that actually did use back in the 1980s, I always couldn't do it to stop nosebleeds. Uh -huh. And I was at bedside. The doctor had to give it, of course. But um, it was interesting to see that it did have a medicinal use. And then atropine is used preoperatively, and it makes your mouth dry. You were talking about the, um, the dry mouth thing and the scopolamine also. It's just interesting to see that the, the um, pilocarpine is used a lot <coughs> in the... Um, yeah, I didn't have any chance to talk about these. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another whole yeah. bunch of plant medicines over here <coughs> that have uh, been used for a long time. I just thought it was interesting. It's retired nurse. Sorry. No, no, that's, that's, that's uh, <coughs> absolutely true. And... Uh, one thing that uh, has been interesting for me is that, uh, you know, I'm at an age where, uh, you know, for example, I take a beta blocker. The person first told me what a, that I was thinking, I'm going to take a beta blocker. It's kind of like, really? What, how do you block betas, right? <laughs> and and uh, so it turns out that a lot of these different categories, for example, the, the sympathetic uh, nervous system, these, these, by the way, are called, referred to as agonists of the sympathetic nervous system. And when you have um, 
that kind of situation, uh, you can actually have different kinds of agonists. You can have subgroups within, um, for example, here. There are, there are subgroups here. There isn't just the muscarinic receptor. There's a, there's a variation on that. What, what happens within the sympathetic is that there are two subgroups within the sympathetic nervous system. And they just were a little short on names that day. So there's, there's an alpha subsystem and there's a beta subsystem. And so if you take a beta blocker, you're, you're really just taking something that blocks the, sy the sympathetic nervous system. You're, you're blocking the, the fight or flight. The, the uh, alpha actually is um, something that, that people take, well men take, if they're having trouble with the prostate. So you, and you find out that a lot of these things um, um, these, these, these different um, uh, receptors not only have a bunch of variations, but they're scattered all over the body. And so it isn't just that they uh, help out with a particular problem, they help out with a bunch of different problems. So you could, you could wind up taking something for one problem and then cause a problem somewhere else. But my, my, message, my message is that um, there, there's uh, sort of a good side and a bad side to, to poisonous plants. You know, we, we, we certainly uh, want to be careful in dealing with poisonous plants, but uh, they've, they've given us uh, so much in the way of um, the development of our civilizations over the years and the and the medicines that uh, we've accomplished with them, um, that kind of we want to look at both sides of how poison is Yes, ma'am. I have a story for you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an American archaeology magazine that I read an article the about April 1st, 
have been in the past a number of groups within North Carolina uh, that would uh, eat wild foods. And a um, couple of them were down at the coast with the, the, the aquaria used to sponsor that kind of thing. And there uh, used to be, there may still be a, a gathering in, in, in Reedsville where people would get together in the late spring and uh, mostly gather spring greens. And uh, you, you may recall or you may know that this actually was a very common event in American culture. It was considered good to go out and, and eat your bitters, right? That they, they saw that uh, these spring plants would, would give them certain nutrients. And actually that was true. Because uh, you know they're they're through the winter they're living on starchy things and sausage and whatever, uh, and so they they go get their greens. Now as to to what plants there are, um, you know some of the classics are uh, dandelion, right? Um, another is uh, chickweed. Now there are two kinds of chickweed in our area. There's uh, what's called mousier chickweed, which is got a kind of a thick stem and it's sort of fuzzy and uh, it's not nearly as nice as um, just plain old chickweed uh, and uh, you know people ate the violets and their red bud flowers, red bud flowers. I'm sorry yeah I caught that but back there yeah, yeah. you got to be a little careful with fiddleheads. Some yeah. fiddleheads are good and some aren't. They have uh, oxalic acid in it, too. The, the ostrich fern is the one that you eat, I think. From what I understand, I actually had some up in Maine that was really good. But if you eat too much, it has oxalic acid in it also, I understood. Yeah. But so does rhubarb, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there, there are a lot of things that, that uh, we get on a regular basis that have uh, problem chemicals. Rhubarb. Uh, she's saying tender daily shoots. Actually, actually, I think all of them. Uh, I think the whole plant the is edible. Flowers edible too. Yeah, daylilies are are eaten by the Chinese as a regular part of their diet. There's a problem with um, um, lettuce quarters. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's very close to uh, spinach. You're in the south. Really one plant that you don't have to worry about. That's the um, uh, toffee. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
critters that you don't want eating the cactus. Right? <laughs> okay. were, were designed to keep some of the animals. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole reason obviously that we've got uh, thorns and the nasty chemicals and and bitter components and plants is they don't want to get eaten, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we take that away from them they may not make it Claire, you don't, don't I remember pokeweed salad yep. pokeweed okay that's an interesting comment um, there, there are a lot of these things that um, are kind of on the poison plant list uh, Wayne had, had mentioned uh, pokeweed uh, Big controversy about pokeweed berries as to what extent, extent those are are uh, a problem. Um, but it's it was and maybe still is in some places in North Carolina very common for people to harvest the the short shoots from from pokeweed. I've eaten it myself. It's you know they always try to tell you it tastes like asparagus, right? It's it's kind of like you know, when you're tasting some other meat, it's chicken, you know, so if, it, if you're tasting some un, unknown wild vegetable, oh, it tastes like asparagus. Yeah, really? No, it, it, it doesn't. But, um, but, uh, that, but you um, have to boil it and boil it and boil it, don't you? Well, it depends upon, uh, Claire was just saying that you have to boil it a lot. Now, there are some wild foods that uh, people do a double boil. Right. Uh, boil it once, decant the water, boil it again. Okay, or or maybe you do that twice. Think of how much you uh, uh, jewel weed, for example, is one of those that. They, you know, are you familiar with jewel weed? Mm -hmm. No. Um, it's it's a plant that grows in very moist soil. It's a touch touch me not. It gets rid of poison ivy. And and allegedly gets rid of poison ivy. <laughs> Have you ever tried it? Yep. Did it? Well, at the time I wasn't allergic to poison ivy, so <laughs> okay. I can't really tell. But. Uh, I, I knew people that used to um, harvest jewel weed and um, make a little uh, sort of like ice cubes. I mean, they would take the sap and they'd put it into an ice cube tray and stick it in the freezer. And then when when you decided uh, that you've been exposed to poison ivy, you take one of these little cubes out, you know, and you just huh. rub it on the affected spot. Yeah. Yeah, another plant that's uh, got some interesting properties that you have to overcome is sting of the metal. Oh yeah. But it's very helpful. Food once it's processed and ate. Yeah. What what about the old saying about uh, grab it like a man of metal? And then you don't have problems with stinging metal. Have you ever, you ever done that one? No? And if you brush stinging metal, you get those little hairs in your skin. But they say if you're, if you're going to use this uh, for an edible, you have to go and grab it <laughs> forcefully. And then you can throw it into the pot and hopefully get something out of it. I don't know if there's a wild. Does anybody know if there's a wild amar amaranthus in uh, yes. North Carolina? Yeah, that's that's pigweed. Yeah. That's pigweed. Yes. Yeah, it, it is. The seeds are eaten as a cereal. Yeah. Kind of like quinoa is yes. becoming that's popular here in some areas of the world. <laughs> you don't care for it? No. Mm. <laughs> Not even the commercial product. No. <laughs> it, it has a really distinctive flavor. You can buy it in some health food stores. Well, it sounds like the last of the questions. Oh, does, yeah, yeah, the, one last one? The, the hopefully you just must never take it when it's already beginning to get the red color. Exactly. That's the important thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you see, the, you see the red coming up from that tuber, then, it's then that's the... Uh, you alone. 
the toxin is coming up at the same time. And, uh, right, you, that's why I say you, you want to take the very first shoot. And, uh, you know, I'm not recommending any oh, of these plants green. for, for eating. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, the berries often have a concentration of toxins because the plant is trying to protect the first generation. Yeah. Uh, so that's the way it should be, but now I've, I've, I've seen. I've seen information literature both ways on this. Um, there are people that say that the, the whole berry is toxic, and there are other people that say if you separate out the seeds from the pulp, that you can eat the pulp. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's I not... The pulp is attractive to the animal that's yeah. going to carry the seeds some distance away. So yeah, and, and, that's, and that's a common theme in uh, the plant-animal interaction, right? But there uh, are exceptions to the rule. Well, it, it, it's very, you know, we have wild persimmon around here, and how does that get spread? Well, you know, the persimmons drop, raccoon comes along, and he either takes the fruit somewhere else, or he maybe even he eats it and passes one of those stones through the digestive tract. Uh, same kind of idea. I mean, why does an apple do what it does? I mean, why does it put that big sweet endocarp out there? It wants to get picked up, right? But then it turns right around and puts a cyogenic glucoside into the seeds. Okay? It doesn't want its seeds to be eaten, obviously. It just wants somebody to carry the thing somewhere else so there can be an apple tree somewhere else but then leave my seeds alone, right? <laughs> and this is a common, common theme too, that quite often you'll see that the, the, the seeds are toxic or the, we, we were talking, Wayne was talking about peach pits. Uh, you know, I think most of you are aware they try to make a medicine out of peach pits. It was called Laetrile. Uh, and they had all kinds of trouble with it. But same idea, you know, the peach doesn't want you to eat the peach pit. You know, just just eat some of the goodie on the outside, take it somewhere else, and then we got a peach tree somewhere else. Right? The pits have cyanide-like properties, right? In the yeah. peach pit, is that what I heard? Yes. Cyanide. Well, I yeah. I think it's fairly common in the rose family actually to have these cyanogenic leucosides, and and. That's a fancy word, right, for just a combination of glucose and cyanide, right? And, and usually there is a, a enzyme somewhere uh, that splits those two apart if the, uh, the plant is attacked or the fruit is attacked, and it, then that releases the cyanide. It's true of most stone fruits to some degree. Yeah, well, I guess almonds must be that way. Yeah. What, what about uh, walnuts or something like that? Would they have, have that? Cashews have to be cooked or boiled or something. Yeah, right. They're poisonous raw, is what I've heard. Yeah, well, they're in the Anacarnaceae, right? The, the poison ivy yeah. families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and mango. I think mango in the same family, isn't it? I, it I is. think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. people can't peel mango, but they can eat it yep. because it's in the peel. So as long as it's peeled for them, yeah. they can eat mango that can't uh, mm -hmm. touch the skin. Huh. <coughs> they, they react to the skin? Oh, yes. Uh, just like poison ivy. Yeah, okay. quite, quite but, severely. But it's not in the flesh. Huh. So you just get it cut up. So you just get it cut up. <laughs> so have a friend cut it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do me a little favor and cut up this poisonous plant. <laughs> things today that people who ate these things, you know, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, couldn't do. You know, we cocaine is not in that plant in the percentages that, that people shoot up cocaine. So yes. I mean it's a difference between the plant and the substance that's causing the effect. I so it was in coca. Cola. It wasn't coca. It was coca and, and coconut and the right. cocaine. Sorry. But it yeah. was in such the, the, the good old days of coca But it was in such good percentages <laughs> that. Uh, well, the Indians, the natives, the South American.
the, where the pain comes from. Yeah. They didn't process it. They That's used right. the leaves to, to help them um, stay yeah. off hunger. Mm -hmm. And they found, especially the elites, found that if they gave it to their people, they would work harder as they were right. building their, uh -huh. their big because they could, because they could work harder. Yeah, because they, they had more yeah, stamina. And it would right. save off the hunger. But that's hunger. the difference between, you know, we blame the plant. But that's really, really, because it's what we do with the, with the compounds that we now are able to identify and then mess with. Yeah. Um, actually, the, the early developers of cocaine were people that were using it as a uh, uh, numbing agent for the eye, for eye operations. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where at first, uh, we're still talking about cocaine, I don't know how much you can hear in the back. Um, but that's, that's what brought it out of the shadows. Uh, and then after that, then people started finding other things to do with it, you know, like making Coca-Cola. Putting it into wine. Yeah, that's right. There was there was a, a French version. Wine marinara. Yeah. Marinara. Something like that. I'm yeah. They com combined cocaine and, and wine. Now, there's a drink for you. <laughs> 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 well, they still see it, serve coca tea um, in the in Peru, so so tourists can uh, tolerate the high altitude. Claire, Claire's saying uh, they still serve coca tea in South America, so that the tourists can deal with the high altitude. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, well. And if you yeah. don't take it, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're, you're, revving, you're revving up the sympathetic nervous system. So, yeah. <laughs> I see. OK. <laughs> um, maybe on that note. <laughs> <laughs>